Hello there, Billy Angel here, your storyteller. And of course, I have a great story for you today. This story is actually number 14 in this first season of The Storyteller. It is the last in this season. Uh, the story is all about David. Now, David has been on the run from King Saul for months. The king wants to kill David, and David has run out of places to hide. He's gone everywhere. Uh, other men who are also on the run from the king have joined David. It started off with 400 and it grew to 600 men. Well, how do you hide from the king and his army with 600 men? So in the end, David decided they had to just leave Judah. Sooner or later, the, the king would catch him and you know, kill him. So David has gone across to Philistia, the land of the Philistines. Whoa, well, those are the arch enemy of the Hebrews. That's a, a risky thing to do. David has gone to King Achish, king of Gath, one of the kings uh, there in, uh, in the Philistine country, and Achish has received him. Whoa, maybe Achish will put David to work for him, and Achish gives David the place called Ziklag, sort of 10 miles to the south, of Gath uh, as a place to settle. Wow, David and his men cannot believe their luck. Here they are in Ziklag, beautiful place. I mean, lots of wilderness here, trees, vegetation, wildlife. There's a river there so they can go hunt, they can go fish. They just love it. Here they can finally build a, a proper base for themselves. No longer do they have to be afraid that King Saul is going to pounce on them any moment, any day. You know, they've been running and running on the run the whole time. But now they can actually kind of settle for at least a while. Nobody knows how long this is going to last. And then on top of that, the men are allowed to bring their wives and children here. So they all sneak off to their tribes there in the land of the Hebrews. They get their wives, their children, their parents, their families, and bring them to Ziklag. Oh, the place is just so happy. All this reunion, all these people meeting one another. It's like starting all over again. And this here is now becoming like a village. And the people are very happy. Of course, they all know this may not last too long. After all, don't forget, we're in the land of the Philistines. You just don't know what might happen next. Well, and indeed, next comes pretty soon. Achish comes to visit David and he says, okay, you've been training with your men to be my bodyguard. Well, here is a job for you. Us kings, we're going to get together. We're going to fight King Saul. We're done with him. We want to destroy his army. We want to get rid of that Hebrew kingdom. And you're going to work with us. You're going to fight with us against the Hebrews. And David is told he and his men are going to come up to the north to a place called Shunem. And there the Philistine kings are pulling their armies together. And then they'll cross over into Hebrew territory. And they're going to fight the Hebrews. Whoa, man. That is difficult now. David and his men are going to have to fight their own brothers. They're going to have to fight King Saul. David's going to have to fight his best friend, Jonathan. Oh my. But of course, David has been playing the game that he hates the Hebrews and he wants to kill King Saul. And well, well you know, and so Archish thinks, okay, excellent. Here's a, a, an opportunity for you and your men to prove yourself. And David has played into, oh, sir, yes, we're ready to fight them. Oh, blah, 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 blah. David is praying that there be some turnaround, some miracle from heaven. Please, God, we cannot be in that battle. But he didn't say anything to King Achish. And then, lo and behold, the miracle actually comes. The other Philistine kings, they don't like this Prince David. You know, he's high up in the, in the Hebrew court, isn't he? He's the son-in-law of King Saul. Isn't he the one that the, these Hebrew women saying he's killed his tens of thousands and all that? I mean, that guy, he could turn against us right in the middle of the battle. We won't have it. The other kings refuse to have David and his men be part of their army. 
And so Achish is sending David back to Ziklag. Well, David pretends to be upset and all this, but in his heart he's very relieved. Whoa. So the orders are first thing in the morning before the battle takes place, David and his men will be on their way back to Ziklag. So that day, the Philistines pull their armies together and they cross the border into Hebrew land and they line up there. Massive army, well equipped, very impressive. The Hebrew army stands opposite them in the same field, much smaller army. King Saul knows he's in trouble. My oh my, the command is given these two armies head for each other with speed and then they clash, massive fight. I mean, this goes on you know, and on. I mean, these soldiers are killing each other. This is real warfare. This is just very, very vicious, you know. Scripture tells us that many, many, many Hebrew soldiers are slaughtered there on the hills of Mount Gilboa. I mean, these Hebrews fight as hard as they can, but they are, after all, farmers who are just volunteering to fight for King Saul. The Philistines, they are all trained soldiers with brilliant equipment and they just come at them, you know, and they come at them and they come at them. And eventually the Hebrews just can't, can't handle it. They are losing. They are just being pushed away. They are being killed. They are being destroyed. And then we learn Jonathan gets killed, his two brothers get killed, and the, the Philistines are closing in on King Saul, uh, ferocious fighting going on. King Saul has got a lot of fighters around him to protect the king, but these Philistines just go at it and go at it. And then we read, Philistine archers just reach the king with their arrows. The king gets hit by several arrows, and he is in serious trouble. He is dying. He's bleeding profusely. He can barely keep himself on his feet. He knows the end is coming. So he turns to his armor bearer and says, here, take my sword, kill me. Before these Philistines get hold of me, they're gonna torture me. They're gonna poke fun at me. They're gonna do terrible, terrible things. Kill me now. But the, the armor bearer doesn't dare touch the king. Well, then the king takes his sword and turns it on himself and he falls into his own sword. And that's how he dies. The king is dead. His three sons are dead. The Hebrews are being destroyed. The Philistines take the victory. And all the villages and towns on this side of the of the River Jordan, on the west side of the Jordan, all these people just run. They leave their homes, their towns, their villages. They run for their lives to get to the other side of the River Jordan, the east side, where there will be some protection. And so the Philistines, in the days after the battle, they take that territory, they take these towns, these villages, all the people's homes, they take a huge amount of Hebrew territory. This is their victory. It's a very dark day for the Hebrew kingdom. The Hebrew kingdom has suffered an enormous loss. Now, David and his men have been traveling all day long. They're on foot. You see, they have some donkeys to carry their gear, but they're on foot. They walk really fast. It's almost like running. And in, in the space of a day, they get to Ziklag. And then when they arrive finally at their camp, they're all looking forward to seeing their families and relaxing there. They are in for a terrible surprise. The camp has been destroyed. I mean, the camp has been demolished, set on fire. It is just gone, just smoke coming up the ground. All the women and children gone. All the animals, God, there's just nothing left but ashes. They are just shocked. They are just distraught. They are gutted. Oh, these men are just wailing. They're crying. They're screaming. They're, oh, God! They, they don't know what to do. They have lost everything. 
I mean, for a little while, it was paradise here with their families, and now just ashes. Death has come to visit them. The men are so distraught, they get angry with David because David did not leave any of them here to protect the camp. They should have left uh, at least a couple hundred men here. But David insisted that all his men come with him to serve Achish. They are so angry, they want to stone David. They want to kill him. But David pulls himself away and then... David knows how to encourage himself in his God. That's how it's written. He seeks God's presence. Oh, God, what do I do? Oh, God, please, where are you now? Where do we go from here? And God comes to him in his presence and with his voice. And God says, this is not the end. Keep expecting my lead. And then David calls Abiathar and he says, now seek God for a word. What do we do? Should we go after the raiders? We don't know who did this and where they are, but we can guess. Shall we go? And the word comes back, go south and you'll have victory over the raiders. Now that's an enormous encouragement. So all of a sudden David is picking up some energy. It's been a very long and exhausting day and this shock has cost him a, another ton of energy but now he says come on man come on we we're gonna we're gonna take this we're gonna take this back we're gonna find our wives and children not everything is lost we still have hope come on let's go and so they pick themselves up and they head south David figures the raiders are probably Amalekites from the south. I mean, David has been there to raid them, and now they have returned the favor in a big way. And so they head off south. The sun is beginning to set. It is the beginning of sort of the evening, and they just go and go and go further south, you know, looking and looking, see where might we see any sort of, uh, any sort of signal of, of these men that have raided us. They're looking on the ground, did someone drop something or anything? And then they find a person, a man is lying on the ground. I mean, he is almost dead. He's barely moving, barely breathing. They get to him, they give him some water to drink. They give him something to eat. They kind of bring him back to life. And then he gradually comes around and he tells them, I'm an Egyptian and yes, I'm a slave of the Amalekites, the, yes, the raiders, yes, the last thing was Ziklag, we'd been there, but I was feeling so ill. I've been ill a few days and today I got even more ill. And my master got so annoyed with me, he just threw me out and left me for dead. And I'm so glad you found me. And David says, well, I'll give you life. You can stay and live with us as long as you show us where we can find your masters. And so that's what happens. This man takes them further south, further south, further south. It's now in the night. Um, they travel for several more hours and he takes them to the spot where the raiders are. And these raiders are actually throwing a party. They have done lots of raids in the area. There's lots of flocks there and all kinds. And they are throwing a party, drinking and eating and having a wonderful time. Little do they know what's about to hit them. So David and his men make a sort of a move, a half circle move, and then they attack. My, they go and fight these men. Now David and his men are good fighters, but these Amalekites are in great numbers. There's not just a few hundred of them. I mean, it doesn't say how many, but I think it could have been like a thousand men. These Amalekites are well organized, a large group and now a battle unfolds, and this goes on for hours and hours. And David and his men are having to fight really hard to get on top of these raiders. And the fight goes through the night, and most of the next day there is fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. And eventually David and his men get on top of it, and they just neutralize that raiding party. A number of them escape. Lots of them die, and the rest of them are just neutralized. The good news is 
the wives and the children are all alive. They're all here, all of them. Not one of them is missing. And then look around. There are just large flocks of sheep and cattle, donkeys, goats, even camels, and lots of harvest materials, all kinds of grains. I mean, these Amalekites have been doing massive raids, and their plunder is just enormous. So after a few hours sleep that night, first thing in the morning, they set off with all of this to go back to Ziklag, back north. And that takes them a while because these flocks, they, they take their time to get them, keep them together and to get them to Ziklag. But boy, David and his men are so grateful. Thank you, God. All our wives and children are here. We can go back and rebuild our camp and be happy as we were. So they get there, they rebuilt the camp over the next few days. Two days after they get back, news arrives. The war was lost. The Hebrews were defeated. The king is dead. So are his sons. David had been thinking about it. And he is not entirely surprised, but it is shocking news all the same. It is horrible news. He goes into a deep grieving, especially over his friend Jonathan, who was just a remarkable friend. And he remembers all the things Jonathan done for him and how they just had such good times together. He writes a song, a, a psalm, a song about Jonathan and about King Saul. David has that ability to separate Saul, the man who was trying to kill him, from Saul the king, who was a great first king of the Hebrews. He'd done great work to pull that country together and lift it out of poverty. So he spends a week mourning and fasting, and then he realizes it's time to get back to action. He divides up the flocks of sheep and cattle and all these animals in smaller groups and then he, he uh, in instructs his men to take these various flocks, these smaller flocks, to the elders of Judah and the villages of Judah. And most of what they got from the Amalekites is now passed on and given to Judah, a great way of building that relationship that David already has. This is his own tribe. And then after that, David calls for Abiathar. Abiathar, ask heaven, should we stay here in Philistia? Now that Saul is dead, perhaps we can go back to Judah. And the answer comes back, go back to Judah. And the next question, where in Judah do we go? The answer comes back, go to Hebron. Okay, wow. So it was great to be here, but it's short-lived. We're going to pack it all up now. And they don't even bother to rebuild that camp. Just pack up what we've got, and we're going to go to Hebron. Now, Hebron is a beautiful city, a town. I mean, in those days, hardly a city, a town, and not all that large. And David, with his entourage, four or 5,000 people, I mean, half of them children and teenagers, and so they go to Hebron and settle in the villages by Hebron. Then something very special happens. The elders of Judah come to Hebron all together. They find David there and anoint him king over Judah. Wow. That came as such a surprise to David. All of a sudden, he is king of Judah. Now, Judah is the largest uh, tribe uh, among the, the 12 tribes of Israel. And he is now, David is now king of Judah. That's the tribe that's in the south. You wonder what goes on in the north. Well, Abner, Saul's commander, has survived the war and Abner has decided that son number four of King Saul, a man named Ishbal, should be king of Israel. My who is this Ishbar? Has he ever been in the army? No, probably not. Has he ever proved himself in any other way? No, nobody hardly even knows him. Uh, uh, did Saul have another son? Yeah, he apparently did. And somehow 
Abner has figured this son should be king. Why is Abner doing this? What does he want? Why didn't Abner just go to David and invite him to be king over all the tribes? Well, Abner, he might have a taste for power. After all, he served as King Saul's second man, you know? And he's had to accommodate all of Saul's twists and, and crazy actions. And uh, maybe Abner has developed this, this sort of uh, feeling that once King Saul is gone, it's my turn. And in a way, Abner wants to be the next king. Yeah, and he'll do it via Ish, Ishbal. Yeah, he'll be the man in charge and Ishbal will just do what Abner tells him to do. Something like this. You know, and... Abner appoints Ishmael king first over a village here and a village there and a small tribe here and a small tribe there. It kind of gradually grows over the space of a few weeks. And when you hear about that, you, you think, what, what is that? I mean, so Abner must have gone to all these places. And indeed, he went there to convince the elders that Ishmael should be king. And these elders might have even said, but what about David? We know him well. We trust him well. He's proven himself. He's a, he was a great commander in the army, has led the army so many times. Why not make him king? Then we can all be united under a new king. But Abner said, no, it's going to be Ishbal. <clears throat> and you better fall in line with this, you elders. And so... Ishbal is king over Israel, I mean 11 tribes. The one other tribe, Judah, has already appointed David their king. So we have a house of Saul, we have a house of David. Whoa, the kingdom has split. That is bad news, because when that happens, you get strife, <clears throat> you get conflict, you get all kinds of suspicions, you know, all kinds of competition, all kinds of unhealthy interactions pushing up against one another. And indeed, before soon, there is all kinds of quarrels, disagreements, people stealing stuff, people, local fights, shepherds fighting with shepherds, all kinds of conflict that is erupting between these two kingdoms. And David is just trying to calm it down, calm down, calm down. But no, somehow there is something brewing that cannot be stopped. And this is what happens. Abner on the side of Israel, the commander there, and then Joab, who is David's commander on the Judah side, they decide they're going to have it out. They're going to have a competition. They're going to kind of figure who is the strongest. Oh, these men, they just insist on fighting, don't they? So they get together in a place called Gibeon. Now Gibeon is actually in the south, in Judah. And so Abner feels confident enough to bring his soldiers, let's say a couple of thousand soldiers, all the way into Judah to Gibeon. And there they stand. Joab, the commander on the Judah side, he brings his, let's say, 2,000 soldiers to Gibeah, and they stand opposite Abner and his, his little army. There they are, staring at each other. I mean, ready to pounce. They just want to fight. What over? What about? Well, it's not even clear, never been talked about. So Abner and Joab decide, let's, let's pick champions, and these champions can fight one another, and in that way we'll figure who is the strongest. Oh, man. So 12 champions on this side, 12 on the other side, and they start fighting. Now they have weapons, and we're told in no time at all, they start killing each other, and after a little while, most of them are dead. Their blood is on the grass. My God. They just insist on killing each other. And the troops are so incensed, there is so much hatred and anger in the atmosphere, they just fly at each other. There's not even a command, we're going to have a battle. And no, they just go for each other. Now, these 2,000 soldiers are fighting these, and they are killing each other. I mean, killing each other by the dozens. It is terrible. After a few hours of fighting and several hundred men have been killed, 
the troops of Judah under command of Joab are taking the upper hand. They are stronger. They are pushing against the other troops and they are having to retreat. And so Abner calls the retreat. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Come on, let's go. Abner and his men have already agreed on a certain place where they regroup. It's called the Hill of Amma, uh, which is like 10 miles from where they are now. And so Abner and his men start running away from this place. But Joab and his men are putting in the chase. They're going to go after and kill a few more. Now, Joab has a brother. His name is Azahel, who apparently is a brilliant runner. They say he runs like a gazelle. He can outrun anybody. And Azahel runs after, after Abner. And Azahel is so fast, he just sticks to Abner. Abner is running away. Abner says, go away, go away. He tries to, sh- to shake uh, you know, Azel out of his way, but it's not possible. Azel just stays with him. Run, 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 stay with Joab and with Abner. And Azel is making this noise. Hey, guys, we're over here, we're over here. What's he trying to do? Well, if a few fighters from the Judah side can catch up, maybe he can, can make, make Joab, make, make Abner trip. And if Abner falls on the ground and he can slow him down, then some of the fighters from Judah can get to Abner. They can kill him. If they kill Abner, well, then David will be king over all 12 tribes right away because we have taken the victory over the Israel army. This is how Azahel thinks. Well, Abner is trying to get rid of, please go away, please, I don't want to hurt you, I don't want to kill you. If I kill you, I can face your brother, which is Joab, the commander on the Judah side. But Azahel won't let go. So all of a sudden, Abner stops. He takes his spear and he thrusts it right into Azahel. And Azahel goes down to the ground. He's dying. He's dead. Whoa. And Abner is on his way. Well, when some other fighters from the Judah side come across Azahel, dead here on the ground, they go back and they tell their commander, Joab. Now, there's another brother, Abishai, who's also one of David's great fighters. So Abishai joins with Joab, and these two just run into the woods, run north to try and catch up with Abner. They want to kill Abner, who's just killed their brother. They are so incensed, they're going to kill Abner. And they're running and running and running, and they begin to catch up with Abner. But then all of a sudden, they have arrived at the place, uh, the hill of Amma. And suddenly, Abner climbs that hill and he's surrounded by like a hundred of his soldiers. And so now there is just two uh, men from Judah, Joab, and his brother, Abishai. And Abner is surrounded by a hundred of his soldiers. And so Abner turns and says, now, when will it be an end to all the killing? Come on now, Joab, stop it here. Stop it here. Call off your troops. Enough men have died today. If we just keep killing one another, we'll be in civil war. We'll finish off both of our countries. Stop it. Call off the chase. If you don't, we'll come down and kill the two of you. And so Joab has little choice. He understands, yes, it's time to call it off. So he gives the signal, and the people in the woods, his men, they understand The chase is called off, and they all begin to return to their base. While Abner and his men go their way, they still have hours to to travel, to run, to go through the woods and into to the north where they have their capital. It's another terrible day for these two kingdoms, you know. And when the news spreads, I tell you, the surrounding kings and kings, you know, these kings in Philistia, the Philistine kings, they love it. Oh, have you heard these Hebrews are killing one another? Yeah, I mean, they're slipping into a civil war. Well, excellent. Let them kill themselves, kill each other. Hey, we'll just wait till they're all gone and then we'll just walk in and take over. It is just the worst. And David, David is speaking to Joab about this. Listen now. If ever I would be king over the 12 tribes, only can only be done if they ask me, if they want it from me and from us. We cannot force this. 
if you had killed Abner, that doesn't mean I'm going to be king all of a sudden. You cannot force it upon anybody. If this is going to work, it'll have to be done voluntarily. They have to want it. And then we can work together. We have to make peace. We have to draw a line. No more fighting. But the fighting continues anyway. And Joab is not giving up on his hatred. He wants revenge on this, the death of his brother. He wants to kill Abner if ever he gets the chance. Well, then something else happens. In the north, the Israel country with the 11 tribes, the, the king there um, is not having a great time. I mean, he doesn't know how to be king. He's never really done anything much. And uh, the kingdom is sort of in decline. You can tell uh, it's just chaos. And nobody likes this king. And it's just disaster. While here in Judah, by the way, David is doing an excellent job and the, the tribe is, in, is flourishing. Well, King Ishmael accuses um, Abner of interfering with one of the concubines in his palace. Ishmael feels threatened by Abner. What's the case? Well, there are a few ladies there, a few women, the concubines. They were Saul's concubines. And then when Saul died in battle, the, 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 these women were still there in the castle, in the palace. And now that Ishbal is king, well, you know, they're his concubines. I don't know if, if he sees them at all. But Abner has been seeing one of these women. And Ishbal feels threatened. He thinks, oh, Abner is trying to take over. He's going to take the women first, and then he's going to come for the throne. He feels threatened, so he gives Abner a mouthful. And he's trying to get rid of Abner, leave me alone, da-da-da-da-da. And he accuses Abner of a bunch of things. Abner is incensed. How dare you speak to me like that? After all that I have done, for your family, for your father. I've served your father faithfully for years. I have put up with so much and I have only kept building, building and building and helping him. And then I put you here to be king. It was my doing and I have supported you. Without me, you would not even be here. And you dare speak to me like this. Abner is so angry that he goes to visit the elders of all the 11 tribes and he suggests to them that perhaps now is the time to go over to David. Maybe David should be our king instead of this lousy Ishbar. And, and guess what? The elders of all these tribes, they agree. It's what they were always thinking. David was the man. It was prophesied. It was obvious. He has proven himself. He's brilliant. And even now you can see Judah is doing great. We are in a misery here. So there is an agreement. Let's go to David and make him our king. And Ishbal can just move over. So Ash, uh, Abner sends a, a word, a message to David in Hebron to suggest that he can bring the 11 tribes to David. He can then be the king. David finds that interesting, okay. And he sends an invitation back to Abner. Why don't you come and visit me here? I guarantee your safety. And then we can talk and make an agreement. So Abner comes to Hebron, but incognito. And nobody even spots him. I, I think he'll put something, a cape over his head or something. Nobody knows that Abner is coming to the palace. David knows, but he doesn't let anyone else know. And Abner brings 20 of his men, and they sort of take a back door into David's palace. And then David puts out a huge feast, a wonderful meal. And these men have a, have a great time, and they make an agreement together. So Abner, at the end of, of that session, which went on for hours, he is going to make his way back to the north where he is based, you know, their capital. And he leaves the palace and he's gone. Just minutes later, Joab, the commander of David's troops, arrives at the same palace. And he hears from some of the servants that Abner was here. What? Abner was here? Well, he was actually here? What? He was speaking to, King, to David? What? And then David just let him go? You, you must be joking. So 
Joab sends a messenger after Abner, try and catch up, catch up with him and tell him the King David uh, has forgotten to d discuss something. Please come back. There's just one more item that they need to talk it through. And so Abner gets that message. He thinks, oh, uh, King David forgot something. And he returns to the palace. David knows nothing of all of this. He comes back to the palace, and just before he enters the palace, Joab steps out of the shadow with a dagger ready, and he kills Abner, who was never expecting this. Abner is dead. His blood is on David's doorpost, right there. My, and then David hears, Abner is dead, right here. My God. And who killed him? It was Joab. Oh, God, no. I mean, just think. Abner is the second highest man in the kingdom in the north. He's come to Hebron in the south, and he gets killed here, murdered. I mean, that could ignite a massive civil war. I mean, now all these, north, all these tribes in the north are going to feel like we're going to kill them. Uh, they're going to feel like we've betrayed them. They're going to come for us. It's going to be massive destruction, civil war, the worst thing on earth. So David puts on what's called burlap. He takes off all of his royal gear. He puts on burlap to show that he's mourning. He comes out of his palace into the streets of Hebron, and he shows people he's mourning for Abner. He shows them how much he cared for Abner, how much he respected Abner. And he sends word round, this was not me. I never ordered this. Uh, this is nothing to do with me. This is Joab. This is Joab's jealousy and his, his need for vengeance. But it is not me. I hate what Job has done. I, I deplore it. I am in mourning for Abner. Abner was a great man. He gives a speech. He writes a song for Abner. And then he organizes a grand funeral and he insists that Joab and his brother Abishai and all the other fighters of, on the Hebrew side, on the Judah side are there in the funeral, all with burlap, mourning for Abner. And then Abner is buried there in Hebron, which is remarkable. Instead of him going, being taken back to the north, David honors Abner and his legacy by giving him such a huge funeral in Hebron. And David continues to fast for quite a long time. So all the people can see and they understand the king is truly sorry that Abner is dead. The king hates what Job has done. David still has his integrity intact. And somehow the people in the north, when they hear this news, they understand. David is still the peacemaker. David is still to be trusted. And so, no civil war. And then we read, the elders from all the 11 tribes come together and then make their way to Hebron and anoint David their king. They make an agreement with David on that day and it says it's an agreement before God, the priest is involved, they understand that God's blessing is essential and that God's blessing is there. And David is now king over all 12 tribes, king of Israel. Wow, that is a great day for the country. And the very first thing David does as, as the new king, he takes his troops to a place called Jebus, where the Jebusites live. And that's a town that David has been eyeing for a long time. And that town has never fallen into Hebrew hands because they defend themselves so very well. But David finds his way in. He's very good at the warfare. He takes the town and he makes it his own. And it's now called Jerusalem, the city of David. So David is king and he, he settles, he establishes himself in Jerusalem. Then the story goes that there's a king out there, uh, the king of Tyre, T-Y-R-E, the king of Tyre wants to, wants to congratulate David, wants to sort of start on a peaceful, friendly basis, and he gives David a palace. 
Now, how is that done? Well, he sends a whole bunch of wood, cedar wood, all kinds of other wood, and lots of stone materials, and, and carpenters, and mason, mason workers, and other builders. He sends all of that to David in Jerusalem, and they build him a palace. David now has a palace, first time in his life, you know. I mean, you can see the story from the cave to the palace. Whoa. And then the Philistine kings hear about this. They have noted uh, David, whom they know well, is now king over all Israel. Well, that is not good. We better cut him down quickly before he gets too powerful. The Philistines have taken a lot of land off the Hebrews. They don't want to give that back. So they pull their armies together and they go to war against David. Well, David pulls his army together. He receives instruction from heaven on what to do. They clash these two armies and David takes the victory. The Philistines quickly regroup, bring in all their reserves and they come back at David a few weeks later with an even larger army. David inquires of God again. The word is circle around the enemy and then for a signal to start the attack, listen and if you hear the sound of marching feet in the tops of the balsam trees, attack because the Lord will go before you and defeat the enemy with his heavenly army. And this is what happens. On that day, David and his troops take an enormous victory. I mean, they just destroy that Philistine army. So much so, the Philistines don't come back to the Hebrews for years on end. And David is now king of Israel. He establishes all the boundaries, he defeats all, the, all the, the enemies around the country and he brings prosperity to all 12 tribes. He is the greatest king of the Hebrews uh, and will always be the greatest king of the Hebrews. And in his line, a thousand years later, another king arises, born in the same place as David, Bethlehem. And this other king, the king of kings, has a kingdom that's called the kingdom of heaven. And that kingdom will never end. Well, maybe some other time I can tell you that story. I would love to do that. But this, for now, is the end of the story of David. In this series, the Hebrews settle into their promised land.